Do we have a next target for an exoplanet that we've been wanting to point this thing at for a while? Whew. Everybody has their own list. Um, I know yeah. one of the one of the hot topics in exoplanet scientists or in exoplanet science that um, folks have been talking about wanting to look at with the James Webb Space Telescope for years, actually since the discovery with the Spitzer Space Telescope, is the TRAPPIST system. Mm. Um, so this uh, particular planetary system has a number of planets in orbits that are in what we call the habitable zone. Um, so they're far enough from their star where they can actually have liquid water. And the interaction of the star, you know, what kind of star it is, how hot that star is, that distance being in this habitable zone makes some really interesting um, planets. And there's a number of them that are actually in this region um, in that system. Mm-hmm. So really understanding what their atmospheres look like and maybe seeing if they have something that's of mm. particular interest and intrigue. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming there's a committee that decides like what to point this thing at and um, read so its there's spectra. A, a committee is sort of not the right word. What we have is a panel of experts that review Um, So everyone in the scientific community can write uh, their proposal to observe any given target that they want to observe, and they have to justify it, um, you know, what the science is, how much time it takes with the James Webb telescope, how much, what instruments they're going to use. And all of these proposals come in once a year. And then we have um, a panel that's established of, of the community members themselves um, and they review these proposals and then they prioritize and rank them. And, and that's just based on what they think the best science is at that time. Um, so we do this every single year because science is obviously changing every single year. There's new planets being discovered. There's other objects that are being discovered. There's um, follow-up observations you want to do from previous epics. There's all kinds of things that we want to do. Um, so having an annual cadence gives enough diversity of the science program to allow, you know, the science to evolve naturally. Um, Mm. So it's all peer reviewed. And um, I guarantee you the TRAPPIST-1 system is definitely on the list of um, exoplanets to be studied. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think we should move on to the Southern Ring Nebula um, to try to explain this one to people. I would say there's kind of two versions. Can you explain what those two versions are? There's one that is has a blue center and then a red outer area. And then there's like a little white dot in the center. And then there's like a negative of that where it's red in the center with a blue on yeah, the outside. I'm it almost looks like a steak. To pull it up <laughs> so I'm talking about the right thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the eight burst nebula, an expanding cloud of gas surrounding a dying star. So I guess what this would be is like um, the infrared spectra that we're reading is showing the gas that's being pushed away from the star as it's dying. Exactly. Um, So I I really hate the phrase planetary nebula, and I I do not like that they call dying stars planetary nebula because it's a total misnomer, and it's very confusing to people that aren't um, in the biz. So... uh, what you're actually seeing is what um, what you just said. It is a star that is dying. Um, so what happens is um, if we have a star like our own sun, as it gets older and older, it eventually turns into something that we call a, a giant, a red giant or a blue giant. And when that happens, it's it's because the, the star has now um, reached a phase that it's no longer burning hydrogen and helium, fusing hydrogen and helium to make um, new atoms. It starts making even heavier atoms. So now it starts burning Mm. heavier and heavier elements. And that that gives off a lot of energy. And all that energy now it has it starts the the star starts expanding. And when it expands, all that that material of the star starts cooling down. So you get this big dusty and gaseous cloud almost that that encases that star. Um, And so this Mm. is where they turn red because <laughs> all of that dust makes the light now a much more obscured and it makes the star appear mm. red and cooler. Um, once it gets to a certain phase where it no longer has, where the, the, that now sort of shroud of dust and gas around the star, it's, it's constantly expanding and eventually it expands so much that now the center star has stopped doing its fusion 
and it becomes a white dwarf. So it's a really tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny hot star. And that hot star is irradiating so bright that it now lights up all of that material that was just shed from the star. And so that's what you're seeing mm. here in a planetary nebula. So all these rings mm. that you see um, in both images are actually the old shells of material that have been pushed away from that star that's dying. Um, and it's emitting in all these beautiful colors because now the center star is sort of lighting it all up and making it irradiate. Mm. So the colors, um, the red that you're seeing here um, on the left-hand image, the near-infrared image, that's all the gas and dust that's remnant, um, sort of atomic material and a lot of dust and grains. And what's fantastic, if you blow up this image and look in any of that structure, that red fluffy sort of structure on the outside, it's crazy amounts of details. You can see almost um, mm. like streaks of light that are passing through each of these clumps of gas and dust. Um, you can see all kinds of different dynamic processes happening just with your own eyes, even not even knowing what they are. You can actually physically see that happening, which is amazing. And this is 2,000 light years away too, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's huge, actually. Um, these things um, span huge distances across the sky. Um, sometimes you can even see planetary nebula um, with with simple backyard kind of telescopes. Um, they're, they're massive. Oh. Yeah, they're fantastic cool. to actually try and observe for amateur astronomers. So you should definitely try to do that. Um, what's really and cool what, about the mid-infrared yeah. image, so the one that's sort of red in the middle with the blue on the outside, is you can now see mm -hmm. that this is a binary star. Um, so we knew that there was a dying star and we knew that there was a binary system, but resolving that second star was something that was always challenging to do. And now oh, we can so they're see right it next in to each other. I'm sorry. There, there are two stars that are right next to each other, and that's why we you shot it in the infrared and also near infrared, so you can see the difference. Yeah, yeah. So the red star, the one on the left, um, in the mid infrared image, so in the one with the red center, there's you can see the two stars. So the red one on the left is the one that's dying. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and then it has a companion star that's the white one on the right, and it's um, much brighter. So this is cool. a really cool um, demonstration of the capability of the James Webb Space Telescope, not only with its wavelengths, but also with it, that beautiful resolution that we get so we can actually see and resolve things like this now. Yeah, that's awesome. So the, the one on the left is basically emitting a different wavelength of light as the one on the right, correct? Yes, and that's yes. why you shoot in both of them? Interesting. Okay, how close are these stars together? Are they like going to fall into each other? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know together? how close they are. Um, I don't know that I have that information. Um, they're, they're not, I don't think they're going to collapse or anything like that. It, they're, it's a binary system that's fairly stable. So they, they okay. probably are pretty happy with where they are. Cool. Yeah. These are, this is an awesome set of images. Um, okay. I think the last one, which is probably the one that everyone has been sharing all over social media and possibly, I don't want to say objectively the most beautiful one, but definitely a very, very beautiful one. <laughs> Um, uh, the Carina Nebula, which is another thing that we have also shot in Hubble, correct? Yeah, yeah. So um, the Hubble image of this is something that um, everybody is probably familiar with and probably seen. Um, we have a really large image of um, the Eagle Nebula. And then this is one tiny little blip of that huge image that we've acquired with Hubble. So mm -hmm. if you look at the Hubble image compared to this, the resolution is nothing near... Um, this level of detail. And yeah. the things that you can see with the James Webb Space Telescope image is, it, it's mind-blowing. There, there's so much we don't know about the process of star formation and planet formation. And that is all the more evident just by looking at this image and its first, the Webb first glimpse of a star forming region. Um, yeah. There's crazy structure you can see. So what you're seeing is um, a giant cloud of gas and dust. Um, and this is where stars and planets are born. Um, and Are they born in that because the, the, the dust 
just like attracts itself to each other and then yeah yeah there's dynamic processes that sort of push through these clouds and causes you know turbulence to happen and once that turbulence disturbs up a a nice dense region of gas and dust it'll cause it to start collapsing on itself um sort of Mm -hmm. initiate that that key process which is something Mm -hmm. we don't really know a lot about so (laughs) Mm, (laughs) um and hopefully something we'll learn more from this from the james webb space telescope there's all kinds of really cool things though so the top of the image where it almost looks like a night sky um that's sort of blue with Mm -hmm. a lot of stars there's a that's where a lot of young stars have already formed and they've already pulled Mm. all their nearby gas and dust um and are probably developing their own planetary systems the cloud and the, or the mountainous region uh, is where all the cloud and the dust is actually starting to form new stars. And you can see all kinds of dynamic processes happening. So if you look just past the center sort of mountain peak with a bright red star in it, um, go to the next mountain peak and you see a yellowish golden sort of star and it has what looks like a feathery hat coming off the top of it and then <laughs> The opposite of that hat, there's something sort of dynamic and arcing going into the cloud itself. And that's actually a young star that's forming. And it, when it starts collapsing all the, the material that it's uh, using to form its star, it has to get rid of a lot of its internal energy. And that often happens as these outflows. And so what you're actually seeing is really, really cool that we can actually resolve this with this, with this image is on the top where it looks like it's puffing through the top of the mountain. Its outflow is actually pushing all that gas and dust out of the cloud. And we can Mm. see that happening. So it's like tufting up out of this mountain. And then the opposite jet is actually pushing into the cloud. And you can see the arcs and and things forming because it basically just hits like a wall. Um, And so all that energy is now just colliding with another dense region of gas and dust, which will probably be the initiation and trigger for other star formations to start happening in that region. Wow. And I'm assuming that like this is going to look the same to us for the rest of humanity, right? We can't like point this at this in 100 years and it's going to look different. (laughs) Um, We might see some dynamic things happening, um, especially with these outflow type um, events. Uh, there's probably some opportunity to see some dynamic um, activity happening, um, but it, it is a pretty slow process compared to, you know, human life. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, you know, that's the funny thing about astronomy is, you know, we're, we're barely a, a blink of an eye in, in all of right. the things that are happening across the universe. Um, yeah. But yeah, this is definitely one of the most beautiful images of all time. And I'm so excited to see what we're going to do with the rest of star formation. I think half the internet is using this photo as a <laughs> wallpaper right now. <laughs> I'm using it as my as, as my laptop wallpaper right now and my phone wallpaper. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Wow. It, was there a reason that we pointed at the Carina Nebula? Is it, Was it just sort of as a way to show Webb's superiority versus Hubble for this kind of imaging? Um, So there was a lot, well, what we wanted to do with these um, first images was really demonstrate all the science themes that we have for the James Webb Space Telescope and show the community and the public that we can actually achieve our scientific goals um, within these themes with, with the James Webb Space Telescope. And a lot of emphasis was put on um, looking at objects that we've already observed before, because there's already a little bit, you know, some foundation of knowledge from these regions or objects. Um, But also if we have things like Hubble imagery, that's something that is easier to understand and relate to as far as when you want to demonstrate the differences between the Hubble telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope. Mm. So what I will say is the ones that were shown were um, just a select few. Uh, They actually observed multiple objects within each of these um, science themes. And they just chose the best ones. Um, But there's more out there. um, And all that information is getting released as we speak. Uh, So we'll see other of the the other observations of um, potential early release observations 
uh, for the James Webb Space Telescope that will be coming out. Um, I'm sure the scientific community will be on it and um, ready to start revealing all the, the hidden secrets that we've had on the project for the last few weeks. Um, but it's really exciting. Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad they chose this one because I think it's, it's absolutely stunning. Hey, thanks for watching that clip. Uh, I just want to end this by giving you the thought because I've also had the thought and I can't have it alone. Uh, JWST turns out to be the most expensive wallpaper generator in the world. The high resolution images it's kicking out and just publishing on the NASA gallery have become the wallpaper on half the devices in my life already. That's It only costs a few billion dollars. That's, yeah, that's a heck of an investment. How many $1 wallpapers will they have to sell? It was like a dollar per pixel, I think. It's oh my crazy goodness. number. I did not know that. That's it's a crazy number of pixels. That's yeah. probably also the uh, most expensive meme generator. Have you? There's some really good ones <laughs> out there. Someone edited like gritty into one of the I nebulas or whatever. What it is. The internet always is is ready. I love that we can learn and have fun at the same time. That's what Waveform is all about. That's exactly. Make sure to subscribe if you want to see more of that. Catch you later. Thank you.